As so often turns out to be the case when you look back at church history, we have a medieval woman to thank for the feast of Corpus Christi. Uh, she was Juliana of Liège in France. She was born in the early 1190s in, uh, in sorry, in Liège is Belgium, I beg your pardon. Not, um, and in that fine European city, there were groups of women who were dedicated to Eucharistic worship. They, they lived together, devoted to prayer and to charitable works, and they were inspired uh, by, by receiving the Eucharist daily, uh, more than once a day, if they could possibly find a priest to do it for them. So Juliana developed a very special veneration in her heart for what was known as the Blessed Sacrament. And like all such faithful people, she took great comfort from the celebration of Maundy Thursday, which is the feast of the institution of the Eucharist. But as we often observe here on Maundy Thursday, she noticed that the Maundy Thursday celebration had lots of layers it wasn't just focused on the institution of the Eucharist, but also on the washing of the disciples' feet, and then later on in the service, the agony in the Garden of Gethsemane. And so as a true devotee of the Eucharist, Juliana longed for a feast day that was outside of Lent in its honour. That desire was enhanced by a vision of the church, uh, which had the appearance of a full moon with one dark spot on the moon, and which signified for her uh, the absence of a singular focus on the Eucharist within the church's year that was characterised by the rest of the moon. Apparently, she had this vision many times over the next 20 years or so, but she kept it a secret. She wasn't sure. Uh, whether she should share it. But eventually, she relayed this vision to her confessor, and he then relayed it to the bishop of the diocese of Liège. And at that time, bishops could order feasts uh, in their own diocese. They didn't have to be agreed by the whole church. So Bishop Robert of Liège ordered uh, in 1246 a special celebration of Corpus Christi, the body of Christ, to be held in the diocese each year thereafter on the Thursday after Trinity Sunday, i.e. today. So the first such celebration occurred at St. Martin's Church in Liège uh, that same year. The rest, as they say, is history. The Feast of Corpus Christi became, well, it became rather a rallying point for the different Christian perspectives that there are on the Eucharist. The feast was intended to celebrate the true presence of Christ in the bread and the wine of communion. And you'll be aware, I'm sure, of the many debates there have been over the, the centuries of the church as to what extent Christ is present within the bread and the wine. There is the old Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation. I can see somebody mouthing it as I say it, um, in which you know, it is believed that the bread and the wine, whilst remaining outwardly bread and wine, trans, uh, transform into the actual body and blood of Jesus. There are others who, who believe that it is more of a consubstantiation, where Jesus is present in the bread and the wine, but they don't change. Uh, they don't become actual flesh and actual blood, but they are, Jesus is spiritually present. And then right on the other end of the spectrum, you have those who believe that the bread and the wine are memorials and nothing else. They, they remind us of Jesus' great sacrifice on the cross, but without Jesus actually being in any sense present in the elements. This, these were important debates, and they still take place within the church today. And Corpus Christi became a focus for those who were really up this end of the debate, the ones who believed that Jesus physically enters the body and blood. And so they would, they would parade uh, the, the, the body uh, held in a monstrance, it was called, a great, uh, a great circular object with lots of rays of sun coming off of it. It would be paraded around whole cities. 
uh, in an ever more devoted display of faith. And, and, and then on the day at the high mass itself, the bread was used to bless the congregation. So the priest shrouded in a, in a great cloth so that the priest himself, and it was a him in those days, could not be seen, uh, apart from perhaps his eyes peeking out so he doesn't trip over, um, would raise this monstrance, as it was called, and bless the congregation. You can still see this practice in high churches, as we call them, around this diocese. You see it take place at Walsingham, where, where some of our congregation go with Bishop John. It is still an, a, a precious practice for those who hold that high theology of transubstantiation. If you go this evening down to our brothers and sisters at Holy Spirit South Sea, I'd be very surprised if they're not uh, parading the monstrance all around the streets of South Sea. But as the debates of the Reformation took hold, many considered that such displays of the Eucharist were idolatrous. There was a danger of making the bread into an idol and of worshipping the created rather than the creator. For those who considered the Holy Communion down at this end of the theological spectrum, i.e. no more than a memorial of Christ's death and passion, it was too great a leap to believe that Christ himself could be present in the bread and the wine. By 1548, the Church of England had abolished the feast altogether. So it's a bit naughty of us to be in any sense celebrating it today, but... I'm not doing it with all the pomp and show. Uh, but as I said, uh, even then in 1548 and beyond, uh, high church Catholic worshippers would still celebrate it in secret. The 39 articles of the Church of England specifically forbade the carrying around of the Eucharist for the people to gaze upon. And so for centuries within the Anglican Church, the Feast of Corpus Christi has always felt a little bit naughty to celebrate it with the full pomp and show stands directly in opposition to the intentions of the reformers of the church. And frankly, it is a topic that continues to divide opinion amongst priests and people of the church today. For my part, well, I think the feast still has value. It's an opportunity for us to focus entirely upon the meaning of the service that we've gathered here today together to celebrate without the possible distraction of uh, other texts and, and issues that the preacher might choose to preach about. It's an opportunity for each of us to ask, what does this service, this Eucharist, this taking of bread and wine mean to me? To you? What's it for? What's its fundamental purpose? Why do we do it? Why should we continue doing it? Surprisingly, perhaps, one of the most profound answers to those questions um, comes from uh, an atheist. The philosopher Alain de Botton has written a description of what he calls, um, what, what he titles the Mass, but the Mass has very many different words, as, as you know, the Eucharist, the Holy Communion, etc. Uh, and he, his view is well worth hearing. It's part of his book, Religion for Atheists, A Believer's Guide to the Uses of Religion. It's a, it's a book intended to, to, to help atheists who want to establish coherent ways of drawing people together, of living together, of thinking outside of their ego and themselves, you know, and, and so to draw from the experience of the church. He argues that atheists need to learn from the church. He, he looks at all the things the church has contributed to community life. Uh, over its history, whether that be through health care or caring for the poor or, or great music or great art. And he argues that any replacement of the church, some kind of atheist church, would have to incorporate these elements that are endemic within the church. But, but let's get back to the Eucharist. He praises the Eucharist or the Mass 
for the way that it brings people together in community around a meal, even if that is a symbolic meal. He points out that with declining church attendance, we have seen an exponential rise at the same time in restaurants. It seems to be something in us that we, that we, we like to gather with others around a table and eat and drink together, don't we? But de Botton points out that restaurants fail to introduce patrons to one another to dispel their mutual suspicions. Restaurants fail to break up the clans into which people chronically segregate themselves. The focus in a restaurant is on the food in front of you or on the, perhaps on the decor and the ambience and, and on the people that we've chosen to sit down with and meet. Other people in that restaurant are largely an irritant especially if they're a bit too loud and they're, they're laughing a bit too much at jokes and so forth. They're, they're a bit annoying, aren't they? Yeah. Most of us, when we go out to a restaurant, would really quite like it if there was nobody else in the restaurant apart from us and our friends that we have gathered with, especially those who've got hearing trouble. Oh, what did you say, dear? No, I can't hear. They're making such a noise over on that table. Yeah. De Botton says, in contrast of the mass, that those in attendance tend not to be uniformly of the same age, the same race, the same profession or educational or income level. They are a random sampling of souls united only by their shared commitment to certain values. The mass, says de Botton, inspires visitors to suspend their customary frightened egoism in favour of joyful immersion in a collective spirit, which is an unlikely scenario in the majority of modern community centres, he says. Do you see what he's getting at? He's saying the church is a place where all are welcome and where all are encouraged to love one another not to, to separate ourselves into the little groups, the little interest groups that we so often do. Well, of course, the Holy Communion is much more than a, a, a gathering of disparate souls into one body, but it is at least that. For me, it's also the chance to focus for a while on something other than myself, my needs, my desires. It's a chance to be drawn outwards from my fragile ego and into the life of the eternal trinity. It's an opportunity to be fed spiritually by the source of all life so that I may be empowered and inspired to live my life for God and for others. So I'll leave you with this question. What does the Eucharist mean to you? Amen.